I just remembered last night that actually worked for a year and a half practicing. I a patient, child, and adolescent in a public health hospital in DC. So went from like finishing doctoral degree to doing clinical work. I mean, was working clinically before then going to UConn, University of Connecticut, and really doing some amazing work um, with the information motivation behavioral skills model, applying it broadly in the HIV prevention adherence. Um, and one of the things I've always really admired about Reve is like she's one of these really brilliant people methodologically. So just across the board, I'm blown away in terms of theory, conceptual models, qualitative skills, quantitative skills is just so rigorous and so well versed, but is also incredibly practical. So I think a lot of times you have folks that have a hard time taking that theory and, and models and applying it to people. And Reve has always impressed me with how she can take that remain true to that, but really apply it to the context across cultures of real people. So when we're trying to work with folks around health and behavior, a lot of times I think there's a disconnect and she's really been masterful at um, bridging the gap between science and people and service delivery. So, um, and, and I asked her Monday, I think, or maybe Friday to give this talk today. She's gonna be in town visiting. So I also have to thank her because she's like, you want, you want me to talk when? And I'll say Friday. So, but said you guys were a wonderful group and somewhat informal and really thrilled to have her with us today. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you. Um, just to get a sense, and I'm sorry, I don't know how you guys usually run this, but I know at least for the people in the room, it would help me to just get a sense of who's working where. Um, so how many people work with HIV? Okay. And then chronic medical diseases? Okay, anyone with adherence? And just because I'd like <laughs> to ask, um, how many people know about PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis? Okay, I've been asking that for years and it just makes me feel good as that starts to get higher and higher over time. So I'm gonna be talking today about the IMB model. Um, I've done a lot of work with the IMB model. I don't have to stay at the microphone. You might need to because we've got folks remotely. Sorry. <laughs> so one thing I don't love is standing at a podium. <laughs> so um, uh, for y'all on the phone, if I start to get muffled or you can't hear me, please feel free to, to let me know because um, I will wander. Uh, I <laughs> promise you that. Um, so I've done a lot of work with the IMB model, and I think that's originally where Mux and I started interacting many years ago. Um, and what I want to do is really talk with you about, let's see if we can get that to work. No. Okay, that's okay. Now I'm also using this. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to just touch base a little bit on HIV. Several of you are working in that area already, but I just want to kind of get us all on the same page because much of what I want to talk about is in terms of adherence, um, and I think it applies pretty broadly across a number of different medical conditions, um, and then also talk about my experiences in moving from kind of like a traditional model or individual model of looking at what promotes adherence to something that's a bit more broader, um, so something that maps a bit more on kind of that social, ecological, or contextual perspective. Um, and show you a couple of intervention approaches related to each of those and really try to move pretty quickly to just a, a more open discussion around things like um, social behavioral models. Um, I know a lot of you are doing research in very different areas or expanding programs in different areas. And I think it really behooves us to think about how are we organizing our thinking uh, around those kinds of interventions. And even when we think about implementation science, how is it that these models might be able to inform us for how can we address things that maybe are a little more proximal than the actual outcome variable, but things that very much contextualize people's experiences with trying to be adherent to this or that, or trying to engage in care for this or that. And I'll try to do that quickly. Um, please feel free to stop me at any time. You don't need to hold your questions to the end. My understanding is this can be very much a discussion. Okay, so in terms of art, uh, I just want to go quickly over a couple pieces with HIV. So, you know, back in like the 80s, HIV was hands down a death sentence. It was really just a matter of time before someone's um, immune system would decompensate. 
and they would have an AIDS-related death. In 1996, there were, uh, well, previous to that even, there were a lot of innovations going on with different kinds of medications. They were typically high burden medications, but they were starting to figure out not a cure for HIV, but how can I slow this down? How can we control this? How can we keep the immune system a little bit more healthy? And it was in 1996 that, uh, at least in the US, there was wide scale availability of antiretroviral um, therapy, or short for ART. Dramatic difference, right? It, it, I mean, it really has transformed this disease into something that is um, absolutely deadly uh, to something that is, is chronic and manageable. And in fact, many people now refer to HIV as a chronic disease. If you were to get diagnosed with HIV today, um, you would be kind of informed of these few things as, as a uh, very important thing to think about as you move forward in your treatment. Well, there's no cure for HIV, right? So it involves treatment, lifelong treatment. Effective HIV treatment reduces the amount of HIV in your body fluids, right? And so there you can see like a lot of viremia flying around there. And over here, we only have a couple of viremia flying around in the blood. The recent uh, kind of discoveries along those lines is that that has tremendous impact and importance to your own functioning. So if we can keep your immune um, system protected longer and as soon as possible, it's better for the individual. The other piece is that you're not able, and I, I'm going to go ahead and say that. It's a little controversial. Right? It, it would be very, 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 very uncommon for you to transmit virus uh, to another individual if your viral load is down, controlled, durably suppressed. That tube there with just a few viremia would be considered durably suppressed. So if you don't have virus roaming around that you would be able, in your fluids, be able to transfer to someone else, you're non-infectious. And there's been several studies now, and it's being bolstered by observational studies, that really drive that point home, that get people durably virally suppressed and they're not going to transmit the virus. So that's a massive finding in terms of how do we end the epidemic. But in order for that to happen, uh, you need to be fairly adherent to your medications. So another thing to keep in mind is that the call for HIV right now, uh, UN AIDS and others um, are, are promoting this 90-90-90. And so that really reflects that 90% of people living with HIV know that they have it. 90% of those um, get access to antiretrovirals or ART. 90% of those use it well enough that they're going to be suppressed. And the modeling suggests that if you're able to reach these targets, you will have a substantial reduction um, in new cases of HIV. So, and we've really done well with that, right? So in 2000, less than a million people had access to antiretrovirals. I mean, that's way less than the number that are actually needed. Um, that was bumped up in 2016 to 18.2 million. And with these 90, 90, 90 plan, the 2020 target is 30 million. So we're actually well on our way of making sure that people have access. It's silly to talk about adherence if you can't first assure that there's going to be access, right? What are you gonna to adhere to? Um, or non-adherence end up not being your fault because it's because of a stockout or not being able to get the medication. So, Given everything we've just said, um, there's still about 40% of people that struggle to take ART consistently, right? So even with the benefits, even with the public health benefits, there's a size, it's a minority, but there's a sizable minority that struggle for a number of different reasons. And it's important to remember that that's not special to HIV, right? So, so non-adherence is not new. Right? It's been around, oh, I don't know, for the last 2,000 years. It's been around since someone started prescribing something. Right, um, And over 40,000 peer-reviewed publications are available about adherence across different uh, diseases. And it's also not uncommon. So about 3.8 million prescriptions are written every year, and it's estimated that 50%, slightly over 50%, are not filled. Uh, that's about a third of people with chronic conditions don't fill their script, and about 60% of people prescribed a medication don't take it as prescribed at some point. And it really is the number one complaint among physicians in terms of how do I control my cases? How do I really make sure that these positive health outcomes are being achieved? Well, and it's not trivial. I don't think I need to tell you. Um, so, you know, 125,000 deaths in the US could have been prevented uh, if adherence had been better. 69% of medically related hospital admissions related to non-adherence. 
Uh, it's about $290 billion a year. So regardless of who you're standing in the elevator with, you will always have a pitch to give for adherence, whether it's about um, economics, whether it's about life and quality of life, um, or just burden on the healthcare system. It's a, it's a significant factor. So, is it to say that, it, I'm not sure what that was, is that me or is that? All clinical outcomes for all patient groups um, are, are affected by adherence, so I'm not going to beat that horse anymore, but um, what, when so I started... Come a little chat bubble, they used to do the um, downloads, a little chat down, the next one down lower, the little arm, yeah, see if there's something. Okay. Great, so maybe nobody else. Can you ask them if it is? So, if you're listening on the phone, we're getting a little bit of feedback. Do you think you might be able to mute your microphones? And maybe you already have it. Do it again. Okay, that seemed to have done it. All right, so when I started doing this research, it was through the early 2000s. Remember I was saying that the antiretroviral uh, medications became available in the U.S. in about 96, right? And so we were thinking, um, what might be driving this non-adherence, right? And at that point, the field was really atheoretical. It was focused on correlates. It was focused on demography, right? Because that was the data that was available. So we could say, oh, if you're younger, you tend to be non-adherent. Or uh, women may struggle more. Men may struggle more. If you're a drug user, um, someone who's injecting drugs, perhaps that's a little bit more difficult. But these were a lot of these, you know, uh, correlates, characterizations, and not really a, you're not going to develop an intervention on the basis of those kinds of things. Um, so what we wanted to do was to really apply a social behavioral perspective of health behavior to the adherence and the problems with adherence that we were seeing for HIV. The model that we developed in 2006 was an application of an information, motivation, behavioral skills model to adherence. Has anyone heard of that IMB model? Okay, so some. <laughs> the reason I ask is it's been applied to numerous, numerous things because you'll see it's a very simple model. It's something that's easy to articulate and easy to use for intervention development. So it kind of has feet and has really run off in many different directions. But the basic idea of the IMB model is that the behavior that you're looking at, the health promoting behavior, is really a function of how informed someone is, how knowledgeable are they about both the condition and the health behavior, um, how motivated are they, which is social and personal, and I'll talk about in a second, and how much skills do you have, right? Do you have the skills to actually be able to pull off something like taking your medication? Um, taking it in a private situation, taking it in the in the kind of circumstances that you find yourself confronted with as you're trying to be adherent to a drug for a highly stigmatized condition. And then you'll see the moderating factors at the top. So the moderating factors here say that the relationships between information behavior, motivation and behavior, all of these things can be muted um, with the presence of certain moderating factors. So if I'm acutely depressed, if I'm an active injection drug user, if I am in a violent relationship, if I am, so all of these different contextual factors can kind of derail the relationships that you, you would think that would be important. So information may or may not actually affect your skills or your behavior. And just put that in the back of your mind because I'm going to come back and talk about that motivation box. But otherwise, the basic idea is, I want to just walk through each one so you have a bit of a, like a, something to wrap your head around when we're talking about information, right? Because, you know, knowledge, attitudes, practice has been around forever, right? And this is just slightly different from that because this is looking at information um, from the, the patient in terms of, do you know about the regimen? Do you even know what correct art utilization is, right? I might have misinformation about what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, what does it mean to have adequate adherence? And also information about side effects and drug interactions and about heuristics and implicit theories concerning adherence. And I think that's important. So cognitive bias, right? Human beings are not these perfect consumers of information where we just kind of take information and don't manipulate it in our head or make it fit what we want it to fit. 
So what happens often is we try to make these, we, we do, we develop these mental shortcuts. Um, and so what you might see is someone who, uh, through an experience of missing their doses, they come to the conclusion that I can miss two or three doses before it matters, right? And they're making that conclusion because they don't feel sick. So the other assumption there is that my dosing, you know, can I can monitor my dosing with how I'm physically feeling. All of those are shortcuts and heuristics um, that tend not to be really interrogated any further than that, but people believe them as fact. Um, so that's another aspect of information to watch for. Motivation in this model is personal motivation is the attitudes and beliefs one has about adherence to art. So what do you believe will happen? Um, do you believe it will be helpful? Do you believe it will not be helpful? Um, how do you feel about that? And social motivation, which is perceptions of significant others' support and the motivation to comply with significant others' wishes. So if you think about that, that's what does my partner want me to do and do I care about that? Um, and is that something that I want to comply with? What does my mom want me to do? What, do, what does my doctor want me to do? So this is really looking at some aspects of it are social support, but it's also predominantly um, what's my social influence, my social push, um, and how do I want to react to that? And then behavioral skills are varied, right? Because to actually dose um, your medication, you need skills to be able to acquire, to self-cue, to self-administer, to incorporate the regimen into daily life, minimize side effects. So all these different skill sets, and you'll notice a little parens there of self-efficacy, because basically oftentimes when we do this work, we're asking people, do you have this skill? So how confident are you that you could take your medication even when your schedule is disrupted? So Anyone doing survey would recognize that, that that question actually catches a number of different things. It catches not only my sense of, do I know how to do this, but also how confident or how self-efficacious um, am I in being able to implement it. And as a side note, oftentimes what we're working with is someone's perceived um, adherence skills because it's not like you're going to go cross-test them on it. It really is just how confident do I feel in my own skill sets. And so if you go back to the model, now knowing what those definitions are, you'll see that there's some structural assumptions here, right? It's not just saying, let's load these all into one regression and see what happens. This is looking at it as a structural kind of um, assumption. And does anyone, does anyone use SEM or structural modeling? Okay, so what kind of model would you say this is? Yeah. A mimic model? Yeah, but more, so a mimic model would, would, okay, I'm going to tell you, is it a mediated or a moderated model? Mediated, so it's a mediated model. Sorry, that's your SEM test for the day. Um, so it's a mediated model. The reason is, is because it's saying that you may see that information is related to behavior. You might see that motivation is related to behavior. But if that behavior is difficult or challenging, this model would argue that it really comes down to what kind of skills that you have. Because if you're really well informed about something and you're really highly motivated to do it, if you don't have the skill sets to negotiate it, it is probably not going to happen. Right? So this is basically saying that for the difficult behaviors, you would really expect that behavioral skills needs to drive that relationship. Right? So it's mediated in that sense. In practice, when we do this, it's often partially mediated, which means information probably has somewhat of a direct effect on behavior and motivation does as well. Um, but then for the most part, what you're seeing is the, the dominant push is coming through the behavioral skills. Now, why does that matter? It has some intervention implications, right? Many of our interventions kind of go crazy on information. Right? Here's our messaging. Let me counsel you on this. Let me tell you all about this, which is great. right? I mean, it's an important factor according to the model. But this model would say if that's all you're doing, um, you're really missing a piece because you're not checking in on motivation. You're not checking in on, okay, now that you're motivated and you have the information, how confident are you in being able to do it? Let's think about what skills. The flip side is, what if you just really hone in on skills? Right? So I say, I'm going to make it totally easy for you. You're going to be able to do this. You have to get confident that you can actually execute. If I'm not informed about what to execute on or if I could care less about this behavior, that's great. I know how to do it, but I need to do it.
as well. So that's where I think it becomes important to think about the patterning of these different factors because oftentimes we have interventions that are localized in one area or another and then we wonder why we're not getting the effect that, that we're hoping to see. Okay. Cool. If someone's online, you guys, if they could just, um, so if, if anyone's remote, we're getting a good bit of feedback. If you could just mute your um, computer or go to meeting, that would be really helpful. We're getting a lot of just feedback on this end. Thank you. Are you guys able to hear okay? Have you been able to follow so far? Any questions so far? You guys wait? You good? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, moving on. So I wanted to um, really complement the IAB model because one of the things that I found uh, extremely useful in that model is that, and this was from Jeff and Bill Fisher, it was before we adapted it for adherence. So this is traditional IAB model. Um, they recommend a pattern um, that you would use uh, to develop an intervention, to move from let's articulate a model to actually let's do an intervention. And because of that, it's been used really widely. I myself have done a number of different structural tests on the model, looking at cross-sectional data and running those, those SEM models, and it's generally supportive. Um, like I said, sometimes we'll get the partial mediation, um, but for the most part, it really does seem to be operating in the manner that that's predicted or that's hypothesized. The reason I think that IAB model is so attractive in terms of intervention development is that they, they specifically say you need to do three things, right? You need to actually elicit the specific IMB as content for a given population, right? So that means doing the focus group, sitting down with people, going out and talking to individuals and key uh, stakeholders and finding out what information do you think is important? You know, what strategies are important? Matching those strategies, uh, you know, developing the strategies and the intervention components that will address what you found and then rigorously evaluate. Even though I think that's why the IMB model has really been picked up and run with, I don't feel and I've never felt like people really attended enough to this particular stage. Um, and I, that will make sense in a couple of seconds. <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit about an IMB-based model intervention, though. So I assume we're going with the IMB model. Um, what we did do is, in around 2008, or concluded in 2008, we made a mixed media um, software program. We called it Life Windows. It was available on a tablet or on a PC. And when adults living with HIV would come into one of the five care sites in, um, in Connecticut, they would sit down with this software. Um, and they were asked to do this for about 18 months. And we wanted to see whether or not interacting with this software when you went into your clinical care visit had any impact on your, um, your adherence. Everybody got it, right? So if you were control or if you were intervention, you would sit down and at least do the tutorial and the assessment, right? And so you would get assessed on information, motivation, behavioral skills. Those would then get computed as either strengths or weaknesses. Um, and so this avatar that would work with you, that's Marcus, the avatar, um, he would come on after your assessment and be like, well, wow, based on what you told me today, I have some ideas about what might be helpful. You know, look over them and, and you know, select one you might want to work with. And then people get a whole list of strategies. I want to know more about my medication. I'd like to feel more confident in managing side effects. Um, I'd like to just feel better about being able to take this. I'd like to use drugs less. I'd like to know what the side effects come from, whatever the strategy is. And then Marcus would come on again and say, well, we happen to have all of these different activities you might be able to engage in to address that strategy. Um, so it was kind of a, at the time, right? I mean, we developed this in 2006 and seven. It was, it was a marvel for its time. Um, so, I mean, now we'd be like, yeah, that's like an app that I have on my phone, but okay. And so the, the kinds of intervention activities that people could do, um, really range. What we wanted to do is to try to really, uh, you know, address a broad range of different learning and engagement styles. So you might have things like Felicia the pharmacist, where you could click on a question and Felicia would answer the question for you. 
Um, there's a, a journey through the bloodstream, which is entirely just a video depiction of HIV, um, antiretroviral medication, and how it kind of controls your HIV. I'll just go quickly through some. That's your side effects one in the middle there where you point on some part of the body. It's like operation, you know, um, and then it would tell you a little bit about that. You could create a calendar. I want to pit stop here for a second because that, that this one that you see up towards the, there, that's kind of a pointer. Um, positive voices. Uh, positive voices ended up having, uh, at least in terms of uh, anecdotal information as well as the time that people would spend on this intervention activity, really had a very um, lasting impact, impact. And I think it's because these were people, and lipodystrophy below it as well, but those were both approaches where we interviewed people living with HIV, who were obviously willing um, to contribute to this, and we interviewed them about their experiences, just what's it like for you? Um, really open kind of experiential discussion. And then we went and edited pieces out and then associated them with specific questions. So, you know, how do you live with HIV? Um, how do you deal with taking meds of every single day? And, and had them really share their personal stories with it. And I think it really hit home for a lot of people um, because it was a very genuine um, and, and, you know, touching in many cases, um, snips that they would be looking at. But then, of course, we also have our games and our funny stuff. So we have Bill the Pill, whose whole thing is, you know, how hard it is and what a bummer it is when he can't get into your stomach and how can you work around that. <laughs> then we have the misadventures of Skips' Dose, who makes like every mistake that you could possibly make when it comes to actually retaining your, your, your pills on you when you have visitors and whatnot. And then we have a game. Um, that was our, our, our only kind of gamified one is, you know, you have to like click and um, kill the virions. <laughs> While you're also refilling your doses and while you're also keeping, um, you know, perhaps some doses in a pocket uh, dose because you have like using Nancy over there that can come in at any time and you don't want to dose in front of her. So it's this game that we're really trying to push across a lot of the concerns that people actually had, um, but we tried to make it not too stressful. And then, of course, you know, just generally what's going on, what do you think is happening? And as a last minute thing, we actually added this certificate. And so this certificate um, could be gone to as an activity. And people put what they want on it. They put the wording, you can put different badges and stickers and whatnot. And then they hit print and they get the certificate. And, you know, we went back and forth on whether or not adults were going to find that engaging at all. And I can tell you, people wanted their certificates. I had to drive from an hour away. So I was in Stores, Connecticut. Something was wrong with the printer in Yale. And there was this participant that, you know, absolutely didn't want to leave until they got their certificates. So, so we made it up there, drove it down there. Um, yeah, because I think often we... we it's engaging, it's real, it's uh, something that someone is proud of. So yes, so something to think about always, I think in interventions. We did a similar thing in IMGs that I'll talk about in a minute where you know, we really gave certificates for completion. Um, you don't think about it, but it really is something that can be very relevant and engaging. So results, outcomes. So we looked at this and we looked at adherence over time. And in the ITT, you can see that the separation there is not significant. It looks like it's going in the right direction. But here in the first one, you can see that the divergence is not such that um, you're reaching significance. We had an on-protocol um, analysis as well. And that on-protocol basically means that you completed at least six clinic visits, which over 18 months coming in every um, three months, uh, made sense. Uh, that was the current, basically nowadays we would call these people retained in care, right? Now for those people who were retained in care, both in the control arm and the experimental arm, right? So we created a retained in care group um, and then looked at it. And there we do see a significant difference where um, the control arm is actually decreasing their adherence over time and the intervention arm is increasing, but then largely just remaining highly stable. So, a couple of things came to me from this, right? So one um, obvious one is that, hey, being retained in care is really important um, and you tend to have better outcomes anyway. And that was not really very popular at the time. Um, so that was you know, one of the things to start looking into. Two strands kind of came, strands of policy, I would say that then directed kind of my research endeavors. 
uh, came from there as well. And one is delivery, right? So if people are not getting enough of a dose of an intervention when it's linked to care and people are intermittently coming into care, maybe we need to make sure that people have access to interventions outside of care or in between the care visits. And so that might be anything with mobile or e-health. Also community health workers. So in a lot of different regions, you know, community health workers are another way that you can get intervention components out into the community. And that way it's not like everything happens when you're coming into care. And the other thing that came to me though is that I thought we needed to expand our focus. So we had a lot of focus on, um, you know, execution. Execution is all about taking the pill, pill to body. Uh, and I think we need to think much more broadly about what it is that people are struggling with when they think about living with HIV, when they think about self-care in the context of a stigmatized condition. And sometimes I think when we work from that IMB model, maybe it limits us a little bit to thinking a little too much on the individual scale. And we'll return to both of these. Let me comment just briefly on some um, ongoing work that we have, which I'd be happy to talk to anyone about. I'm just going to go over a very broad overview. But social uh, networking website is the thing that we're working on. This is called Thrive With Me. And it is a, it is a computer-based, right? So it's not an app. Uh, we started it a couple of years ago. I uh, didn't feel comfortable about the app aspect. So it's something that someone would go to online. But essentially, we tried to mimic uh, we tried to mimic a social website, meaning uh, we let people actually post to the board, which was very controversial at the time. Um, at the time, there was a lot of concern that if you let people just post unmoderated to the wall, um, that people are going to go crazy. They're going to you know really like shun each other. They're going to set up dates with each other. They're going to you know, it's just not going to be used the way that, that we really want it to be used as part of an intervention. And we did not find that um, actually at all. In, in the Thrive With Me with uh, Keith Horvath at University of Minnesota, um, a lot of the posts, and we just uh, did a summary of the posts actually. I no, I didn't. Um, so we just did a summary of the posts and presented it. But uh, if, when you looked at like the kinds of posts that were going on, they were very equivalent to what you would see in like a social media or Facebook or um, that kind of thing, where they were t typically social support um, and uh, and mundane. You know? Yeah. Did you have a few people that you like planted to like, start the post off to get the tone? direction you wanted it, or so did you just open it up and let it go? We had uh, clearly identified team members okay. um, that were allowed to post in, so that's exactly what we did. So it would be that it, we would clearly be from the front team and be like, hey, what's going on with da da da, and just to see if we could get it. And so we did prime it, um, but we didn't want to prime it up here. Like, we didn't want to be working in the background. Like we wanted it to be clearly like, hey, up front, um, this is me, what do you think about this? Um, the other pieces though that, that came out were things like, I'm going to the gym today, hey, I lost five pounds, um, I am trying this new diet, what do you guys think? Um, so it was very interesting that it ended up being used, I think very much like a social networking site would be used. Um, so we were, that, that actually is still in progress. Um, we have another year before we have the final data to be able to look at that, and that's predominantly uh, working with folks on the East Coast and it's with MSM, living with HIV. We recently adapted it for the new ATN network, which is the Adolescent Trials Network, um, and we're adapting it for youth and to be used as an app. Um, so we're really excited about that. That's youth living with HIV who are by remix. So this is looking at how can we really help them to, to, um, to try to control their HIV uh, using, you know, uh, mediums and realities that are much more common to them, right? A little more foreign for me. So the other thing that we've done is looking at peers and texting. Uh, just to support newly diagnosed MSM in China. And this was part of um, Sten Vermont's work that he did as an MP3 in China. And this was in Beijing. And what we did was we linked newly diagnosed MSM to peers. Uh, so when they came, we kind of did both. When they came into clinic, they met with peers. 
Um, and we did kind of uh, IMB model-based counseling, uh, a little bit of motivational interviewing. But then when they left, they also followed up with them um, on calls asking if they needed anything. And that would be more like um, one of our colleagues, Richard Lester, had developed a program in Kenya where he called or text. People were text once a week, are you okay? You doing all right? And if they text back, yes, everything's fine, done. If they text back, no, I need someone to talk to, a nurse from the clinic would, would outreach to that person. His work in Kenya actually um, was very significant on improving virologic suppression, simply by doing that. Um, so we layered that on to this project as a way to kind of cover the gaps in between care when people show up and we're looking at the results on virologic suppression. I want to just share a little bit of like what it is to actually do research in the real world. And this, <laughs> the guidelines around the world changed for when people should start antiretroviral medication. Remember I said one of the big findings has been that, wow, if you start early, not only are you better, not only are you, um, does your immune system really keep its integrity longer, but you're also non-infectious. It led to a call for countries around the world to change the criteria, which previously had that you had to be you know, somewhat sick before you started antiretroviral therapy it was in some ways a way to manage kind of the distribution of therapy. So you had to have values um, in your CD4s that would suggest that you're starting to really be compromised. That all changed to, nope, get people started. Get people started as quickly as possible. This project that we did, one of the main outcomes was time to art start. So we wanted to really reduce the amount of time it would take for um, newly diagnosed MSM to get on antiretroviral therapy. That change in government policy basically killed that outcome, right? Because the, the standard of care, the control that we were against was, oh, it's going to take a really long time to get on antiretroviral therapy. And so we were thinking that the people that we'd be working with, we would be able to facilitate, to capacitate, to advocate to get on antiretroviral therapy earlier. And we wouldn't lose them in the process because a lot of people drop out of care. So real world kind of thing, I think happens more than um, we'd like. And it's actually a good thing, right? So it's, it's a great improvement to the public health policy. At the same time, you're really racing to change your, your protocol endpoints. Um, true story, so I don't know how the results are going to actually come out on that one. Um, and then I did want to also note some work that we do in Uganda. This is with uh, Larry Chang over at John Hopkins, um, because that also uses the IMB model, but in a very interesting way. So his work is in uh, Kassensero, where there's a very high, I think the prevalence of HIV is like 44%. It's, it's really um, quite everywhere. It's on the edge of uh, Lake Victoria, fishing village. And so what he wanted to do was to train community health scouts. So these would be, these would be individuals that live in this community um, that the community would elect or identify as being really good health scouts. So we would then train them in order to really facilitate their ability to implement, you know, good practice. Uh, this is prevention and counseling. Um, what they developed a cell phone, uh, an app version, a smartphone version of uh, this IMB model. So you would go through and ask a series of questions with your household that you're meeting with. The phone would help you with what's the next step going to be, right? And so it might say, offer this or inquire about treatment or ask for more information. And so basically, this, uh, this is the team. I go out at least once a year to train and retrain um, with the community health scouts. This allowed um, people that may have not had counseling background or may not have had a lot of background in, in what is available uh, for prevention and combination prevention to be really good at implementing this because they had the piece that's so important, which is that community engagement and trust. So that one too, the results are pending. So before I move quickly into the um, situated IMB model, which is kind of what I wanted to get us to, are there any questions there? Comments? Yes. 
So very practical question. Yeah. So if you, you're building all these apps. Um, how do you actually do that? Like, you, do you work with people who, you know, like what's that process like in the real world? Oh yeah. Um, yeah, we don't build. <laughs> I think the best thing you can do is know what you don't know. And we don't know that. So <laughs> what we do is we are able to be very clear about what we'd like it to do. Um, and then we partner with a company that has skills in actually doing the app development. Lately, there's, uh, and I think I should say not lately, but more and more recently, uh, there's uh, companies that really are, are niche in this. Like they are demonstrating that they are very good at taking a health kind of program and developing engaging apps for it. So, for example, we work with Radiant for Youth Thrive. Um, I'm working with Radiant again for another project that I have for adolescents that's going to be using um, media. So I think you really need partners in that. Yeah. And to follow up again on, on this, um, is uh, do you use like grant money to get that and how yeah. involved are you with that design process? You're, uh, I personally am pretty involved because I'm, I mean, I'm not an interventionist, but I'm pretty close to an interventionist, so I want to be very involved. Um, with with what's the user interface, how's that going to look. Um, the company that we work with, which is grant funded, because how else are you going to fund it? So you could either try to get foundational funding or internal funding, but I'll, I'll build it into my NIH grant that, you know, phase one, develop that. Or maybe you go with a smaller grant just to kind of pilot an app. The um, reason that I'm involved, and so the, the way it works, and I think this is pretty common throughout, is that they will follow their model, which is a, a design-based model. So they have sprints, they have, you know, their, their kind of team meetings that are to develop, you know, X for the program, and then they come around and share that with us. Then they leave us alone again and go and do their own thing and then come back again. I think. I think you're involved, but only in the parts where you can actually help with, because I think if it's a full team thing, it'll never get done, right? So it's it's fun. I actually really enjoy it. I, I think it's a very cool, um, it's a very cool intersection, right? Between what you can offer, because you know your patients, you know how people interact, you know what might be important, and then what they offer, which is this whole world of user interface, engagement, um, and those kinds of things. So I want to talk a little bit about the situated model. So remember one of the other things that, that kind of hit me after working with the Life Windows project was that um, maybe we need to be looking at engagement, right? Not just like am I consuming a pill, but given that that's part of like a much larger self-care spectrum, Maybe we need to be thinking more broadly. So I started thinking about what would an IMB model look like if we were talking about engagement and care. And I really struggled with that moderator box. So remember I talked earlier about how, you know, if you're depressed, if you're a drug user, if you're an IPV, if you're, you know, whatever it is, that that would, like that would somehow kind of put you off to the side. When we're talking about engagement and care for HIV and for other marginalized populations, that is life. Like that, that moderator box is exactly how it is that you need to negotiate care. So I was increasingly disenchanted with the moderator box because I don't want to put everyone I work with off to the side. I want a model and an intervention that works exactly in those situations. And so in developing a model to address engagement and care, I, I had to I had to do some changes. Um, and so what I proposed was a situated model. And I'm using the term situated here to say that even though I might be working with an individual on their knowledge and you know, misinformation and their social and personal motivation and skills, that I have to think about it as being nested and having branches in all of the different layers that actually influence this behavior, that influence life on a daily basis. So uh, folks familiar with the social ecological model? Yeah, so I think people love the social ecological model because it makes sense, <laughs> it's always nice. Um, but also it really forces people to think about context. What it doesn't do though, is it doesn't really talk about the intersections between these. So it says, you know, hey, think about things at this level, but it doesn't really help you to kind of glue it all together and think about, okay, well now how do I work with all of this? 
So what I wanted to do is to develop a situate model, an IMB model, that's actually situated within this larger social ecological context. So what does that actually mean? I mean, what it means essentially is that we're still interested in information, motivation, and skills, but the kinds of information we are interested in is not just about disease, it's about information that would span all of these areas. So are you informed about your rights as a patient? Are you informed about someone not being able to share your HIV status? Are you informed about your uh, ability to you know, get care privately? Um, so all of these kind of factors, really thinking about uh, the content. So we can say information is important, but what kind of information is important? depends on the population you're working with and specifically in terms of how these factors are articulated in relation to the health condition and in relation to the context in which the person lives. Does that make sense? Okay. I guess that would be kind of hard to be like the one person being like, no, no, <laughs> no, it really doesn't. You need to back up. <laughs> okay, so let me talk to you a little bit about this. So I also changed some of the ways in which the constructs are articulated. Right. So for information, and this is uh, this is looking at a situated IMB model for engagement in care for chronic medical conditions. So think broadly here. Um, treatment information is important, right? So, but not just the treatment that you're receiving, but treatment available to you, right? That's really what makes people activated around their condition is is actually being knowledgeable about what is the course of treatment and what new is out there. The treatment process, right? What's this, this quail? How is this going to go through? Um, what are the costs? How do I work with that? As well as the condition, right? So what's the anticipated course of condition? Adjustment process. Um, so a lot of models don't have anything about adjustment process, but there's an adjustment process to being diagnosed with a, a chronic condition, especially if it's a life-threatening chronic condition. And how that information, that knowledge that this is a process might be very helpful in activating people around their engagement. And then also just knowing about the system of care. So again, very much beyond do you know about your medication and the regimen, it's really talking about how much do you know about this whole system you're about to enter. And then motivation also is defined a little bit differently. So for my work, what I was interested in is the consequences of adoption and non-adoption in the context of feelings. So there's really no emotion in the other one. This one's really talking more about like the context of feelings about self-care. What's, what's your affective kind of response to treatment priorities and demands, um, as well as lack of resources. So it's not enough in my mind to ask about, you know, why do you want to do this, right? I mean, the, the classic medical dimension is, you know, here are all the reasons why you should adopt this health behavior and all of the reasons why this one that you're doing right now is really, really bad. But it's important to think about the pros and cons of everything. So there are pros to me, uh, you know, not stopping drinking. So you want me to be abstinent from alcohol? I'm sure there's benefits to it. But in my life, I have benefits to sticking with it. And oftentimes we don't engage people in that conversation and we miss a whole side of what the factors are. And the same thing with social. So, you know, this is personal and then social. What's the, what's the impact um, for adoption and non-adoption of engagement and care in the context of your social relationships? How does it impact your social standing? Your social self, we all have a vision of who we look like to other people. How does that impact? Um, and then also, what are your feelings about the flexibility of your social relationships and situations? If you're a mother of six, um, and you are in a role where there's a lot of gender discrepancy. You know, do you have the social flexibility to be able to say, hey, I've got to go to this med appointment. Um, someone else needs to take care of my kids. Or, hey, partner, you need to take care of my kids. So really thinking about all of those social layers. And then behavioral skills. Now, I'm not going to read through each one, but suffice it to say that we organize things in terms of systems navigation skills functional skills. Um, so this is literally, how do I get there? Um, you know, how do I cover my transport? But then also activation skills, right? And so activation skills are, are more along the lines of how do you manage your affect around this? Like, how do you, how do you manage feeling negatively um, towards having HIV? Uh, how do you get health literacy, right? It's not going to fall on your lap. Are you going to be able to have skills of pursuing it? So these are all the things that you might think of in the classic kind of chronic 
care disease model as like your activated patient. So it's kind of looking at those factors. And that model we've actually applied in a number of different um, interventions. And I also, Laramie Smith has done some work uh, looking at cross-sectional assessment and being able to look at it from a structural perspective. I wanna take a pit stop and talk about I engage because that is Muggs's um, intervention, and it's also one of the interventions that pulls quite specifically from that situated I and B model. Can we stop? Is there a comment down there in the little orange? I am pretty new. Okay, I'm pretty new to this, but I have a broad question about the model. How would you compare this to the health belief model? Yeah, so I think with the health belief model, um, one of the things you don't have, and I don't know that it makes that much of a difference, you don't have that strong knowledge, misinformation, and heuristics piece to it. Um, and then you don't have the same structural hypotheses. So I think the health belief model otherwise compares a lot. And I recently did a review of many health behavior models and they share more than they don't share. Um, so I think your comment is bang on in the sense that almost everything talks about some form of motivation, some form of skills building. Um, knowledge depends on, on how you know it's done, but things like perceived um, severity and perceived vulnerability are also kind of nested within that motivation component. So um, I don't know that that helped, um, but I, I personally believe that there's more in common than not. Can I? Great, yeah, thank you. Okay. Oh, she said great, thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Sorry, I am new to this as well, obviously. I'm okay. new to this. It's a orange bubble when I'm you know. So, um, motivation and motivation and skills. Yes, yeah. uh, please, thank you. Just tell me, make it easy enough. I don't need any of it, I'm good. Um, so we've used this model a lot lately, um, and, and we, I, I don't feel really comfortable saying that it's a you know, profoundly superior model. I don't feel like we have the data to do that or to say that. What I've liked about it is in, in the way of developing interventions, um, in a way that's more nuanced and more comprehensive and frankly, I think more sensitive to the fact that even if you're working with individuals, individuals make communities, communities make populations. Um, so I, I think it's, for me, a step in a direction that I'm much more comfortable with. So I, I did want to talk a little bit about I Engage. Um, so I Engage, which uh, most could tell you way more about than I can, but um, it, it, we drew from the situated I and B model of, of initiation and maintenance in HIV care specifically for this. And this approach um, tries to engage uh, people who are new to care. Um, so they're just starting at your particular care site. And we thought that if we could really help them to start off you know, right, so to say, and really engage them um, in special ways during their first uh, year in going into care, that we would be able to help them to form um, the kinds of engagement patterns that we want to see, rather than waiting for someone to drop off the radar, be lost to care, or really struggle a long time before you turn around and say, hey, there might be some ways that I could help you. And the ways in which we wanted to do this actually were both um, of the ways that we talked about enhancing delivery, as well as addressing things in a more comprehensive way. So it kind of had both those streams in there. So the the counselors, um, basically uh, the intervention arm gets linked in with a counselor and the counselor meets with them each time that the person comes into care, but also reaches out to them per telephone in between. Um, not only to check in on how you're doing, but they're also gonna place reminders for, hey, you know, you've got a visit coming up, are you all good with that? Um, oh, you know, it might be an opportunity to check in on a goal that you might have set. Very important because really that first session is happening right as someone's starting to deal with all of this. It can be overwhelming when you're first entering HIV care. There's a lot of tests, there's a lot of people you meet, there's a lot of forms you have to fill out. Um, so this we were hoping would be a way to kind of help with that managing the stress and managing that affect. I don't expect you to read this, um, but this is the model. That, that we came up with uh, that really deals with initiation and maintenance of care. Um, 
the way that this is articulated, right? So that's great if these are the constructs that are important, but you also have to think about how am I gonna engage people on those constructs. So when we think about what the individual counseling sessions did, um, it was SI and be informed. So we trained counselors on here's where we think kind of these dynamics are coming from. And then also train them on motivational interviewing strategies as a way to try to help to engage people to not only increase you know, the health behavior, but importantly, let them have voice to the reasons why they don't want to do the health behavior. Because remember, we are saying, if you really want to have a complete conversation, you need to understand every reason why I absolutely want to keep drinking or smoking or not show up here or avoid taking this medication that makes me feel sick. So again, that was a way to kind of capacitate that. And so each session, the interventionist, you know, after framing I engage, they would exchange information about HIV care. So not give information, but really exchange information. So I have a little bit of information. I'd like to share it with you. You share it. How does that fit with you? What's concerning about that? What's the strangest thing that you think coming from that? Is that different than what you learned? So really promoted discourse in giving information and receiving information back. That also we explicitly discuss an adjustment process, right? We, we actually have figures. We show people, you know, it's very much like the, um, you know, shock, um, denial, you know, and really talk to people about it. It's not uncommon to go through this because we wanted to normalize the experience and also really build hope that this is a trajectory. You are not going to be here forever. Um, and it's uncomfortable for right now, um, but, it, but it will not be the rest of your life. Uh, and also really try to get people to anchor in on what their current strengths are and what their concerns are. And then we would engage them in different activities or modules um, and then set goals that we would follow up with. And the modules really range. So it ranged from organization, prioritization of self-care, commu communication with treatment team, treatment anxiety, affect management, structural problem solving, and referrals, as well as a couple of add-ins. If the counselors felt as though stigma was something that was really um, bringing down their ability to self-care, they would they would stop and talk about that. If there were concerns for disclosure, um, so I want to tell someone my HIV status, we would stop and do a module about disclosure. Um, all of those modules have components that span that situated model, right? So you can think about, you know, oh, you have organizational needs. Where is that falling? Does it cut across the different social ecological factors? Is it informational, motivational, or skills related? So really working with the counselors to kind of have this in their backdrop, I think really facilitated them in being able to uh, meet the person where they're at, be able to do targeted and tailored kind of um, counseling sessions in a way that's quite relevant. So the other thing that we did that I encourage people to do is that we measured IM and BS over time. So many times when we do interventions, we're so occupied with the outcome, right? You know, is A1C going to go down? Is, you know, is viral load going to be suppressed? That, that we don't spend enough time to think about what are those pathways? What's the causal pathway there, right? It's not because they showed up and got randomized that this is going to have this great outcome. No, you would expect certain things to change. Maybe they find the, the behavior easier. Um, maybe they're better informed. For us, we wanted to know about specifically IMBS. So we have measures that's tracking that. So over time, we're going to be able to see, OK, well, did people in the intervention arm improve their information more than people in the control arm? Did they you know, increase social motivation more than people in the control arm? So I think those are really important questions to be able to ask about the impact of the intervention. And if it did all that and it still didn't change the outcome, that's a different story than it changed the outcome um, and I have no idea what happened in between. So it's the idea of being able to really tell your story in a way that's you know, more similar or more mapped onto the actual real experiences of your participants. Results pending. Uh, oh, I did want to comment though, we did get uh, for the 2017 Adherence Conference working with uh, Michael's team, we got together people's uh, reported barriers uh, that they felt towards engagement care. Remember, as part of the session, we would do a brief screener and we'd ask people, you know, what are your main concerns? So what was interesting for us is that you can see that some of the, some of the concerns are feeling angry and resentful wanting to avoid thinking about HIV, these are things that could keep you from coming back for your next visit, feeling sad or depressed, uh, don't want to be seen by others. Quality of care was legal issues, respectful treatment was uncommon, and concern over not being able to afford costs was at about 19%.
had endorsed that. And to me, what that's saying is that I feel like we're on the right track with starting to think about cognitive affective, right? So one of the things with the situated model is bringing in the emotional components more and the skill sets for how do you handle that? How do you prioritize your own care even when you're feeling exactly like that? Again, we don't want to put them off to the side. We want to actually bring them into the model. All right, I've talked a lot. Um, and what I wanted to try to do is just transition a little bit to an e well, obviously whatever questions y'all want to bring up. But some things that I think we need to be thinking about is how do you use the model in intervention development? And if you're not, think about it. Um, think about why not. Think about whether or not you should. Um, and how do you use a model in implementation science, right? It's not just about research. It's actually a lot about how do we get effective programs out there and actually evaluate them. And then why does it matter, right? I have conversations all the time with why does it matter? So why do I need a model? What does it matter? If I, if I have an intervention and it changes the outcome, who needs a model? And I just like having that debate um, because I think there's different ways that you can think about it. Um, but be ready for that because if you do adopt a model, undoubtedly someone will ask you, well, why do you need a model? Um, and then what models do you use, right? There's so many different models and ideas out there. You know, how do you pick? What makes sense? And just what are the greatest challenges in mapping out causal and contextual pathways to a given outcome? So that means we all have working models. Not all of us articulate it, but we all have working models about why it is that someone's choosing to do this. It's for everything, it's not just adherence. Um, it's how we work. Um, so the challenge is to really articulate it, to sit down in your group and to really think about, okay, well, you know, we're working with diabetes, we're working with people not showing up or, uh, you know, failing to adhere to medication or not doing blood glucose tests. Why? Like in our population, why? And you can kind of go back to that social ecological, you can go back to that SIMB model and really try to just brainstorm. Um, sometimes that's the beginning of what your focus group's going to be. You can find out more. Okay, so I will stop and be quiet and go back to the questions. Yeah, please. I've had a lot of colliding thoughts as you've been talking, so I'm going to try to eventually get to a question. But I've gotten really stuck on motivation uh -huh. as you've been talking, so I don't think we do a great job at motivation. Because I've been trying to situate this into like, what I've seen in clinics, and it seems like you know the doctor delivers some information, and then a person's not taking their meds, maybe me, the psychologist walks in and does MI, and then the pharmacist comes in later and does behavioral skills. Which is that, and we, we're not reinforcing positively very well. It seems like people are taking their medications to avoid bad outcome like getting sick and yeah. that's not particularly helpful for reinforcing behavior over time. So I'm curious about your thoughts on how we sort of add more positive reinforcement to adherence and engagement and on the side also understand how you can measure motivation because I've always found that very difficult. Yeah, um, so let's tackle the first part. So we do have a number of different approaches um, that we use and different trials. I mean, a lot of them actually developed around PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis for me just because that's what I've been working on lately. And um, those approaches very much focus on establishing facilitators, barriers, needs. Facilitators, barriers, needs. Um, so the idea is that if you can get people to reflect on uh, when is it easy, when are the times that you really feel like this is not a problem to take your pill, and summarize that and let them actually have that moment, um, and then turn around and say, okay, and when are the times when it's when that's not possible or then it gets in the way? What do you think needs to happen for you to feel more comfortable, you know, taking the pill when your wife is late coming home. So it's the idea of not asking this general, like, well, what needs to happen for you to be adherent, but, but actually having a moment to talk about here's when it goes well, here's when it's challenging, right? So what do you think would need to happen for that to be like a little bit easier? And the reason we say, what do you think needs to happen and not say, what do you think you need to do? is that it may have nothing to do with you. It may be something about changing my prescription. It may be something about, yeah, my wife needs to blah, blah, blah. It may need, you know, but it could be something about shifting the situation. So we find that um, 
in having that kind of discourse, it allows people to not really be defensive because they're defensive, right? They know that you're telling them they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. The other thing to be really thankful for is that they're telling you. Um, many, 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 many people will totally avoid um, sharing with the provider that they're not adhering um, to something because they, they fully anticipate that you will now sit there and lecture them and then you'll get the pharmacist and then you'll get that exactly the, the, the triage that you were just saying. So some things that are fun to do as well is just flipping the script. So whatever you think the standard patient expects you to say now, say something completely different. So when they are saying, you know, oh, uh, you know, I really missed two pills, they're expecting you to be like, oh, I really need to take it and that's going to be bad for you. Try to say something completely different. Of course, that is really hard to take pills all the time. Yeah, they get it. You don't walk out of the room at that point, right? Because that would be bad. That would be like, oh, Dr. So-and-so said I should only take two pills. But you, you stay there for a second and let them actually feel like uh, you understand where they're coming from. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can do to, to change it up. Hardest thing, though, you need to want to. Um, and you need to, you know, kind of get the folks behind you uh, where you're working to, to adopt it as an alternative. Happy to send you material if you want to go champion that. Um, no, but just think about, so just thinking about this interprofessional, one of the cool things about our group is we're interprofessional. So you've got folks that are psychologists, social workers, nurses, physicians, pharmacists. and do you know of thinking about this idea of motivation, whether it's personal or social, like it is so different for each individual. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's I've got young children and I want to see them graduate from high school. You know, so whatever that right. motivator is, and it might be that one person on the care team uncovers that. I'm wondering, I mean, do you know of situations where people have tried to then make sure identifying what are the key motivators um, and sharing them across a care team? So I'm thinking like maybe, you know, maybe you, Kaylee, have the, you know, you, you got this nugget of information, but then Anthony goes in as the social worker and doesn't have that same nugget. So in terms of reinforcing, like for this person, right, probably the motivator is not to achieve viral suppression. Like that's our goal, but, right. you know, it probably isn't what someone's saying, this is why I'm taking my medicine, because I really, really want to achieve viral suppression. And so, you know, um, um, so I'm just wondering if you know, if, when we've been able to unpack that, you know, right. we've had to do some intervention or translating into practice, because care is so interprofessional, you know, have there been folks that have tried to say, once we have this, how do we share it so it's not just the peer mentor or the outreach worker, but everyone on the care team right. that can give reinforcing messages that for this person one at a time, this yeah. is what really is motivating them for whatever that health right. behavior might right. be. So, for, and just to comment on that, um, you don't want seven people giving the same message, right? I mean, it, it, it will lose its impact. So if you have like six people kind of being in like, oh, great job. Oh, great job. You want to see your kids graduate? You want to see your kids graduate? You, you definitely don't want that. That being said, of the people that that's important to, for example, say you are handing off to the provider, you're handing off to the social worker, um, I would very explicitly say it of like, oh, God, you should tell them about what you were just telling me about, you know, John's 11th grade, da, da, da. That way it's extremely overt, right? And it's something that uh, doesn't, I'm going to use the word triangulate, but the more overt your care team can be in sharing information um, appropriately in front of the client, the more they are going to see you as a team. Um, as opposed to, you know, thinking that, oh gosh, I just told that to Muggs, I didn't want him to tell anyone else, well, now he just told it, and it's like they're all going around talking about it. So, I mean, just to be cautious about those kinds of things. You had, you had another question, though. How do you measure motivation? How do you measure motivation? So, um, there's many different measures of motivation, all, almost all, if not all, are self-reported. Um, and that's where you get into your stickiness. So, um, so these are items that really are your standard, um, you know, I believe or I feel good about my antiretroviral meds. Um, I feel good about coming into care. Um, coming into care is frustrating and bothersome to me. That's your balance, right? Your positive, negative um, gut response to it. Um, but the other pieces, and it's the standard surveys, um, there's not one standard survey, right? So we've used an IMB measure of motivation over and over again. Doesn't mean it's perfect, no. Um, we will never be resourced to make that like, you know, MOPS or DAST or CAGE or any of these other measures that have like bajillion different respondents and weighted and we will not be able to do that. However, um, I do think our measures get pretty close 
in general. Where I will say I do not think that they get close is in situations where you are collecting that data and people believe that you are using that data um, for some undisclosed purposes. So some of the work that we've done in uh, Cape Town, for example, with pre-exposure prophylaxis with women who are participating in trials, they were really worried about getting kicked out of the study, right? I mean, you know, they, they were pretty sure that it, they didn't look perfect, um, that they would get kicked out of the study, not get the benefits of the study, which were many, right? So in that case, I think it's, it's you will get garbage. Um, because it's easy to play it. It's not like it has a lie scale. It's not like um, there's a way to see if someone's got too much self-presentation going. So it's very overt. So, but in my experience, you can measure it, um, barring those factors. And for, for IMB and SIMB specifically, there are two instruments, you know, with multiple items mapping to information, motivation, and skills specific to adherence. I don't know, Renee, how much the adherence has been has been adapted outside of HIV adherence. You know, could, could it map to motivation for diabetes or hypertension or other? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, so there's, yeah, there's IMB models for uh, diabetes. So um, Chandra Osborne um, had come. We have IMB models for sweet and beverage consumption. And then also, then, and then also yeah, and yeah. to your point, though, then also then having that the, the measure, because I think that was one of the neat things, you know, working with Reve is like they did. We have this model, we have these outcomes, but we really want to have some way of determining, you know, if it is working through this pathway, and if so, how much differentiation in information motivation skills were observed in intervention versus control arm, and explaining what yeah. outcomes we do or, or do not see. Equally important, you know, um, right. in a negative study. And we, um, we've had that experience. You can look in the literature of, of that experience of people running these IMB or Anderson behavioral model or health belief model or whatever model. Um, and then you get right to like the intervention outcomes and there's never, to me, a, a much investment in unpacking. Um, so if it's effective, cool. Is it effective because of the way you thought it was gonna be effective? Because if it wasn't, what else is going on there? Because that's gonna matter. If that becomes policy, if that's gonna get generalized and all of the factors you thought were causing it were not causing it, how do we know what we're generalizing here? Um, or, you know, is it particularly weighted in one direction or another? Well, people really changed in motivation, but it didn't seem to have an effect. Then we need to think about, are we targeting kind of the right things um, in our intervention? So to me, for the science to advance in any kind of a systematic manner, um, it really behooves us to think about what are these causal pathways? Because when we don't, all we end up are with these packages and as you know, many times when packages go to different communities, they don't work um, for a lot of reasons, but that might be one of them. If I can just make a comment or just to make sure I've got it yeah. right, because I've been working with you for years, and this idea of moderator-mediator distinction I think can be challenging, so just to make sure we're on the same page. And so the IMB model, when thinking about things like depression, stigma, resilience, coping, as moderators, you know, that approach is the idea of I will differentially obtain information, motivation, and behavioral skills based upon if I'm depressed or not. So it's outside of that saying there will be a differential ability to achieve these skills and outcomes whether I do or don't have this. And, and I think what you've said, Reve, and what I was really drawn to with the situated model is the reality is it's not just strictly going to say if you're depressed or not depressed, have stigma or don't have stigma, um, those things should be part of actually how we're delivering the information. And, and so that idea of what is a moderator and versus what is a mediator in causal pathway, but um, and not necessarily taking these moderating factors and saying they're all mediators, but saying I need to deliver this content in the context of the fact that someone is living with. So I think everyone got that. It took me a little while to get that. Um, so you guys are smarter than me, but I think that was a really key distinction for me clinically saying it doesn't resonate to say this is going to, you know, you have some sort of interaction effect based upon these. This is who I'm seeing, and as you said so nicely. So that I think was a really tremendous advance with the situated model because people are people and people <laughs> have a lot of these moderating factors in their lives. So right. I think that was a really important, you know, um, adaptation that really, for me, clinically has, has really resonated. Yeah, I think um, 
when you work with marginalized populations, right, which, which we do, or lower resourced populations, stigmatized populations, um, you know, I think, I, I think we absolutely have to be thinking about things in a more complex way. Because um, it's not simple, <laughs> right? Is there an application for this for the work that you do? I know you all work in very diverse areas. I mean, where does, where does your working model of why it is that you're seeing what you're seeing in your particular area, where does that fit? Where does it come from? I think for me, um, when you shifted from like the medication adherence to engagement, mm -hmm. engagement is so global and I feel like so relevant. <laughs> I mean, even for me, so I'm doing research in palliative care. Yeah. And so even in developing an intervention tailored for my population, which is in liver disease, mm -hmm. I think like, I mean, a lot of times some of the issues we have is why aren't people getting palliative care? And so this is very helpful globally, I think, just to think about, you know, all the different factors that play into it. Yeah. And I do think it starts at the table, right? I mean, so so I think realistically, I don't know if it's the best way that this happens, but um, but it starts really thinking, of, if you're familiar with the literature, you're familiar with some of the outcomes, you're familiar with some of the correlates, right, that you see with whatever outcome you're looking at, and to really start unpacking it, but then getting into the community and, and thinking about, does this resonate with you? What else would you put on there? Some of the things that I actually just did, I just gave a workshop in um, San Francisco for a group that is going to be implementing PrEP um, in transgender populations, so transgender men and women. And we actually, I created a blank of this. I mean, so we had talked about it, but then I went back and created a blank of, um, all of these factors running through the social ecological model just list and we broke up into groups and actually filled out the lists of oh information information was right next to the social ecological model what do you think is important here for transgendered women in accessing prep we separated it for prep uptake and prep adherence um, and it was a really useful exercise uh, just to see kind of the things that the community called out as being most relevant with motivation or what kind of social challenges are going to be there as well as reasons to avoid um, wanting to take prep or avoid adherence. Final questions or comments? Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks. I'm Yeah, how do I? Um, yes. yes. Do you have the USB? You want me to just send it to you? I, I could run upstairs and get my files. I think I have to be somewhere no, no, at 930. Do email. you have your call? Do it. I will. Do an I will email and I will, I'm will. i totally fine sharing my slides with you. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to. Yeah, that's why I like this. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, Right? 